Hello there folks, welcome back to the Chaps Guide. My name is Ash and I am your host on this journey through men's style, self-development and personal grooming. Now today I'm going to do a Q&A video because I've got a feeling this may be the last time this year where I get to come up here to the woods and have a fire because the weather's changing, it's getting warmer, although today it's a little bit wet. So I'm dancing between the, the showers and I'm going to try and answer some questions from you folks who've sent me some questions just recently seeking some advice on a sartorial matter or something else. Now, please, I fully accept the irony that I am sitting in a woodland wearing a barber jacket and I'm going to be meeting out advice on sartorial matters. I am conscious that I am not sartorially dressed myself right now, but that doesn't stop me making observations and supporting you with some questions and answers. So, my first question comes from Nick Cole, who wrote to me and said, thank you for the videos and the advice. And the point he makes is, I am going to a wedding in Spain in April. I would love to wear my old Dax suit. Now, Dax is a British uh, former custom uh, clothier, certainly a, a tailor, used to be tailor to His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, the late Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, but, lovely manufacturer of garments. So, um, Nick says, I've got an old Dax suit, going to a wedding in Spain. It's got a light Prince of Wales check. I'm not sure whether to go with a light shirt with a dark tie or a darker shirt with a light tie. What are my thoughts? Well, here's a picture of the garment in question. And as you can see, as he says, it's got a light Prince of Wales check running through it. Uh, and I like it, actually. It's rather unusual. You don't see too many like this in this day and age, which is nice because, you know, we don't want everybody to look the same. And I think this will look lovely in Spain, which is a lighter climate anyway, a warmer climate, certainly than the UK. And the lighter hues to this suit are going to be just perfect for a warmer environment. What do I think about wearing a darker suit, sorry, a darker shirt with a light tie? I'm not a big fan, all right? The way I think of this, I often think of the shirt being the blank canvas on which one paints the sartorial uh, sort of landscape of one's outfit. And for me, that means almost always wearing a, a single color, so not stripes, not anything else, a single color, light colored shirt. Now for me, a white shirt is perfect, uh, or a light blue shirt, or a pink shirt. One of those three you will typically find me wearing at any given time. Now in the instance of this suit, what strikes me initially is that I can see a light blue stripe running through that Prince of Wales check. Now that for me tells me all I need to know. I would be wearing a light blue shirt with this garment because there is continuity within the suit itself and then the shirt. And then the tie becomes the expression of your personality. So I typically wear ties which are in contrasting colour to the shirt so that they stand out and are very obvious. Uh, I often go for burgundy or something from red when I'm wearing a light blue shirt because they are very, they mix well together, I tend to find. However, you say it's a wedding. Now weddings are one of those occasions where you can throw caution to the wind and you can wear lovely cheerful ties uh, that you might not ordinarily wear if you were in a corporate environment or maybe in work or something like that. So knock yourself out. But for me, because of that light blue color running through the suit, it screams to me a light blue shirt would be the natural marriage. A white shirt or a pink shirt would equally go but for me, light blue is going to knock it out. Now I've got another question here, and it's a little more philosophical than straightforward sartorial advice, and it comes from Inter Ryan Esquire. Funny old name that. <laughs> you know who you are if you know what I'm talking about. But simple question he asks, have you ever considered wearing a bolo tie? Cheers from Appalachia. Well, bolo tie. Never owned one, never worn one, but if you're in the right place in this world, I think it is the appropriate tie for that, for that place. Um, just so that we're all familiar with what we're talking about, a bolo tie. Now a bolo tie is traditionally either made of cord or of braided leather, and uh, it tends to have uh, sort of metalwork tips, which are called aguilettes. So, you know, 
uh, often silver I think they are so you get silver tips uh, agalettes as they're called and it has a brooch or a slider or a clasp in which these strands of either braided uh, leather or cord of some kind runs around the neck. Um, you will be familiar with these, you see them all the time. They are traditionally associated with Western wear, so you know from maybe the southern United States, the, the parts of the world which consider themselves to be the West, and yeah I mean I have seen them myself in many times. Um, they're quite ornamental, they're quite decorative because the slide and the agalettes, those um, metal tips to the cord, tend to be often of high level of metal working in the better levels of bolo ties and they can be incredibly stylish. I've seen many of the brooches or the sliders uh, adorned with um, turquoise and I think there's an association with Native American metalworking over many uh, decades in the production of these things and I think they're rather beautiful. Well, I, I, I was fascinated to learn more about them though and uh, I discovered that the bolo tie is actually the official necktie of Arizona which makes sense you know it's a very much a western state in America it's also the official state necktie of New Mexico and it is the official tie of Texas since 2007. Now I've been to all of those states and I have seen people often in bars and the like wearing their you know cowboy hats, uh, western hats and their bolo ties and I think it is emblematic of that part of the world. So for me personally I don't inhabit that world at all. So a bolo, a bolo tie wouldn't be appropriate, it would really stand out like a sore thumb. Uh, it would be the equivalent of one of those guys in a bar in Houston in Texas wearing his bolo tie. Instead of his bolo tie maybe he substituted that with a bow tie. He would get the same incredulous looks from the other patrons that I would likely get if I wore a bolo tie in my locality. But that is not to say that I'm not uh, a fan of the item if it were an appropriate situation. So to answer your question in that way, I haven't worn myself, worn myself, I would consider wearing one if I was in the right part of the world. Now I have been in the right part of the world many times. In fact my first ever visit to the United States of America took me to the great state of Texas uh, and I've also visited Arizona, New Mexico and so on many times. It was a place I visited annually on my winter holiday from here in the UK. And I remember the first time I, I, this is a bit of a side story here, you want to learn more about your host here. Um, the first time I went to the States, I was at home and a friend of mine, uh, a very close personal friend, he came to the house to say hello and he told me his wife had just left him that week, that day I think it was, and he was in all sorts of sort of, you know, he was in a total twist. He didn't know what to do, it was unexpected and he was very upset. But he said to me, being a sort of forward-thinking gentleman, he said, listen, I'm going to take this opportunity, I'm not going to let it destroy my life, I'm going to go on holiday, I'm going to go away for the sun. Now this was in December and he said, do you want to come with me? And at the time I was single, I was um, able to take a uh, holiday or leave from my job at relatively short notice, not many people on holiday in December. So I said, yeah, yeah, why not, I'll take a few weeks off and we'll, we'll shoot off somewhere warm. So we did a bit of research and we found ourselves looking at places like Tunisia and you know all the, all the European haunts close by that you would expect from Europe. Um, but none of them were particularly appealing I have to say you know when you've been to them you've been to them there's no excitement. So we looked a bit further afield and we found that you could fly to Houston in Texas for like £150 return flight at that time of year. So we went and booked a flight and we just flew off to Houston. We'd made no arrangements at all, no hotel, I think we'd hired a car and that was it. We got there, we picked up our car, we didn't know where we were going to stay, what we were going to do. We had two weeks to kill, a pocket full of money and uh, you know the intent to enjoy ourselves. And there began a two week long bender of two, I think I was about 30 years of age, I was in my physical prime and we just went for it, we drove through Texas, New Mexico, you know we went everywhere and a lot of alcohol was drunk and a lot of fun was <laughs> engaged in, um, particularly I remember be, spending a weekend in San Antonio and Albuquerque and such places and it was a really 
fabulous period of my life. In fact, I repeated it about five years on the trot afterwards, so much did I enjoy it. But this was my first introduction to the world of Western wear. And I remember going into bars there, you know, quite um, European dressed, one might say, you know, a floral shirt, maybe with khaki trousers, and being uh, struck with the bar being full of rather rough, rugged cowboy looking gentlemen, all in their Western attire. And I really fell in love with that lifestyle. I really, I'd never liked country music at all. Started going to some country bars. I remember going to, there was a place called the Flying Saucer in Fort Worth. I remember spending a lot of time. And there were a lot of uh, country music acts, you know, playing in the places we went. Live country music absolutely won me over to the genre. Uh, but I'm sorry, I totally have digressed from the question, which was about bolo ties telling you my experience of the places where the bolo tie is actually the official state neckwear. So there we go. Sorry about that. We went off on a total tangent. Uh, but let me get back on track with another question, which I will endeavour to answer forthwith. Now, I've got a question here from Michael Engel, who has said, a question about breaking in pre-owned shoes. And he says, um, let's have a look. Question about breaking in uh, shoes which have been owned by others. He says, once the leather liner and cork bed inside the shoe has taken on the shape of the previous owner's footwear, how long does it usually take for the shoe to take on the shape of your foot? He says that he has found it uncomfortable with the various ridges and such which have been left behind from the previous owner of footwear. Now this is one of the things which I often get from traps who I think are a little fearful of entering into the world of pre-owned footwear because there is a bit of a, an uh factor, isn't it, about buying other people often dead man shoes because if you buy them from eBay or you buy them from maybe a charity shop we do not know their origins have they come from the estate of a recently deceased gentleman whose next of kin have passed them on or is it just somebody who's fed up with that style and is moving it along to buy something else and there's a bit of a uh, factor I think with many men who don't want to buy dead man shoes we'll call it that just for the sake of argument now they often will come up with things like, oh, I don't like, you know, the thought of somebody else's foot having that shoe being formed around the shape of the other person's foot. I wouldn't have a second's query about this at all. Modern footwear, all right, the cork beds, things like that, it is not as it used to be in maybe vintage footwear. Um, I have owned dozens if not hundreds of pairs of pre-owned shoes over my lifetime. I'm a huge fan. I've probably got 25 in my collection at home now, which have been owned by other people. And I can honestly say I have never had an issue with the sensation when I've worn shoes which are new to me, which have been owned by somebody else, where there is maybe the sense of somebody else's foot shape within that shoe. Really, the only impression that the foot will leave on the footbed maybe will, will be the heel and the ball of the foot, which are the points of the foot, uh, really where you know any weight is sort of passed through to the, sh to the footwear. It's never been an issue for me. Do not let it put you off. Um, if it is an issue, I would imagine, you know, cork, whatever, uh, the leather liner, these are very soft, malleable uh, materials. They will very swiftly conform to your foot, just wear it a few times. Um, you know, do not let the erg factor put you off saving a fortune and wearing shoes that you would not ordinarily be able to find the funds for with your lifestyle. Now I'm gonna stay with shoes for my final uh, question here today. And this comes from Drozy who says, Dear Sir, I have a question. I don't have any navy blue shoes in my shoe collection at the moment, uh, and I am planning to get one or two pairs. Would you suggest a cap toe Oxford or an Adelaide? Thank you. Well, first of all, let this address the, uh, the shoe colour, because that's really the elephant in the room. The, the styling of the shoe, uh, what did you say, an Oxford or an Adelaide? I find it somewhat inconsequential, right? They're, they're so close together, um, in construction, it's not going to be a big thing. The big thing here is the fact that you're talking about a navy shoe. Now these, you do see them around, it's not a very common colour. Uh, however, I think it's a very serviceable colour because it is a colour which would typically, I think, be able to be worn with most colours of attire. So the, th the, 
The only colour which I wouldn't be too comfortable uh, marrying up with maybe navy footwear, maybe grey. Um, for me, grey and blue, yes, you can wear a light blue shirt with a grey suit, no problem, it actually works very well. But a deep navy shoe with a grey suit, I don't know, it, there's a bit of a conflict there for me. I don't necessarily feel that they would sit together very, very well. So the navy, it's gonna go well with khaki, for instance, pretty much any color of chino. If you're wearing suits, uh, a navy suit with a navy shoe, is it a bit too much? Is there no contrast there at all? That's the issue you have, I think. Because generally speaking, when we look at shoes on people, there is going to be a contrast when we look at the shoe. If you're wearing a burgundy shoe and a navy suit, for instance, or navy trousers, there's an immediate contrast. We see the shoe, it's picked out in our, you know, our visual impact because there's that difference in colour. I think if you had navy suit, navy shoe, all in sort of continuity, I'm fearful that the shoe, which is such an important foundational part of one's outfit, is going to sort of just blend in with the look and we're going to miss it entirely in its impact in the suit. So for me, I would think very carefully about the niche role that that navy shoe has to play in your, uh, your overall wardrobe because you may only be wearing it with a few certain items within your formal attire. Now I say formal attire because you are talking about an Oxford and an Adelaide. Now an Oxford shoe, as we're all familiar, Oxford is just the, the lacing system. Um, I'm guessing you need a, a cap to Oxford. So this is quite a formal shoe. It's a shoe which is probably the height of formality that most men will ever wear in the modern world. Uh, and the Oxford just relates to the lacing system. So an Oxford shoe, the lacing is kind of integral in the construction of the shoe, whereas a Derby will have kind of flaps that the laces go through, which are sewn onto the shoe, the upper of the shoe, as a separate entity. The Oxford, it's all included in one piece. It's slicker, it's more stylish, that's why it's considered more formal. Uh, a navy blue Oxford, I think, it, I think it's fighting each other there. There's, co there's an incongruity between the height of formality and a colour which I don't really see in that field. So think about that. The Adelaide is basically a, a form of brogue where there is um, more adornment displayed around the shoe in the broguing. Um, I really like Adelaides, personally. I think they are very interesting. So of an Oxford or an Adelaide, I would immediately lean towards an Adelaide because I think it's more interesting as a shoe. There's more going on, there's more uh, interest. But I would say be very careful when you consider the colour that you're considering because you may find it less flexible than maybe another colour. Now, as you say, you're thinking about getting one or two pairs. I would say start with one, see, see where it takes you. If you've got a massive shoe collection and you're only going down the route of uh, so we say navy because that's a new colour to you. It's a brave new world, give it a try. But try one pair first and see if it works out for you. So there we go, folks. I'm not going to uh, labour the point today. Um, I want to get this video out tomorrow. So I'm going to take it home, edit it, and you'll be watching this uh, tomorrow, most likely, in my world. Please feel free to drop me an email with your question. I'll try and do some more Q&A videos as we go along. Uh, and I'm always happy to pass my observations on and maybe give you my thoughts and views. Um, next time I'll try and be more sartorially attired, but uh, spring is sort of well underway here in the UK. Uh, it's been raining somewhat of late, hence my sort of uh, woodland attire today. So apologies for the um, maybe conflict of styles in comparison to the topic, but I hope you've enjoyed the video all the same. If you have, give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more like this, click the subscribe button. Don't forget, drop me an email with your question or put it in the comment section below. I will capture it and use it in a future video. If you'd like to practically support the channel, you can buy me a coffee, that's uh, a one-off thing, or you can become a patron and join the army of patrons I now have who benefit from the additional video content that I make each week and the very personal relationship I have over on my patrons page with them. And find out how to do that by following the links in the show notes below this video. So until the next time, take care. Maybe the last time this year from my woodland fire and I will see you again very soon.